All right, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you all to having coffee with me this morning. And for old friends, I want to say hello. And for new friends, thank you for joining us. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So these are three of the big references I'll be starting with this morning. So what my goal is, is to talk to you from the lens of a sex therapist. Um, some of you know that my training was originally with John Money at Johns Hopkins, and there I dealt with individuals who were hypersexual, and some with paraphiliacs, and individuals who had sexual addiction. And then I was moved to Masters and Johnson, where for most of my career I was working as a sex therapist and worked as a marital therapist. And... Um, Masters and Johnson really did not see inhibited sexual desire. They missed it. You know, it was Helen Kaplan who originally brought this into the focus. And it makes you wonder how something so ubiquitous could be missed. And I'm going to suggest to you just in a critical way that I think there's a certain level of dissociation professionals seem to have about this because although Masters and Johnson didn't notice inhibited sexual desire, Helen Kaplan once stated that she rarely saw sexual compulsivity. And of course that was in high proportion. The other thing that I think is quite important is that in the area of PTSD, which has been burgeoning and trauma, there's practically no chapters on sexuality and trauma. And that's insane because almost everybody who's got sexual abuse has some difficulties related to sexuality, of course, and yet so little is written on it. And then there's the field of sex therapy and a lot of sex therapists haven't been trained in dissociative uh, trauma-based in interventions. And finally, as I think about my own career, I eventually went into the specialty of eating disorders in the body and I realized how little I knew about the somatic aspects of this. So the field tends to get focused on what they're specializing in and don't see the bigger picture. So I, in this slide, what I've tried to do is say to you, my goal really today is to talk to clinicians about how to do therapy with traumatized individuals around sexuality. And by the end of the two hour period, you're gonna have much more improved skills. Now, I have to admit that my model of treatment is probably not um, widespread. That is that a lot of people might disagree with what I'm gonna be saying to you. And the data is my clinical data based upon 40 years of experience now. So I'll tell you what I found that worked and what didn't work. And you have to wait and judge it for yourself. But the reason I think this field is so complicated is that it hits so many things. I mean, all the things I've listed here are relevant. And honestly, the client usually won't tell you because you know there's implicit memory and explicit memory, and a lot of this is implicit memory, and they can't, it's not salient to them. They don't even know what the problem is. So rarely does a client come in and tell you what the problem is. And so you have to see what emerges in the process of the therapy. Sometimes they have a very poor differentiated sense of self. Sometimes they have avoidant attachment. Sometimes they have deviant sexual arousal patterns that scare them. Sometimes they are meshed with their partner. Sometimes they're fighting with a partner. And if I could just say something really simple that might be the way to um, pull together everything I'm going to be saying today. Number one, it would be that most sexual problems of traumatized clients can be treated effectively and in brief therapy. And uh, the, the model of treatment we'll be talking about. And two, even though it's really complicated and there's a lot of issues associated with it, as you can see, a lot of them can be dealt with in a brief format and a lot of changes can occur in a short period of time. And that may surprise you because 
you know, I think there's still this idea that uh, trauma therapy is long-term therapy and the sexual part of it is the last part of it um, and not necessarily so. So we'll be talking about all these areas as we go along. Now, the other interesting thing is that, um, this is a really cool slide because it begins to look at what's happening in the brain. And people are always like saying, oh, you're, what's causing your sex drive? And maybe your testosterone is too low, or maybe you know, your adrenals, or maybe this, maybe that. And there's not a, a perspective of recognizing that really almost the entire brain is involved in sexual arousal. And you know, what's happening in the body is only reflected what's happening in the brain. So there are two aspects of it. One is, is that there's what turns you on and then what turns you off. And what you see in this is that in the right side, you have people who have inhibited sexual desire, hypoactive sexual desire. And there's a decrease in the neuronal activity in the medial or orbital frontal cortex, as you can see, um, particularly on the right side, uh, on the top and the bottom. And this area of the brain then uh, is directly wired into the genital pelvic area and can either stimulate or inhibit that. So one of the difficulties I think in people's uh, understanding of sexuality is that it's a subordinate category of bonding. And so I've always said that sexual problems are really problems of intimacy and relationship. Even if you're not in relationship, it's gonna manifest itself oftentimes in a, in a relationship. And if you have a void and attachment and you're highly anxious, then what happens is, is that the system turns itself off, as you can see on the slide. Now, what we're dealing with with the vast majority of people that I treat is what's called disorganized attachment. And with disorganized attachment, what happens is, is there's both activation and deactivation simultaneously. So the person gets positively uh, motivated to bond and to connect and to be aroused and then gets terrified simultaneously. And it's a mirror of what happened in childhood where the person you depended upon for safety was also your perpetrator. And they both get activated in adulthood. And so sexuality gets both turned on and turned off. And that makes it really confusing. And so understanding that lens is really going to be important for how we treat this, because not only do we have to facilitate the arousal patterns, but we also have to deactivate some of the unarousing patterns. And so, you know, a lot of this has to do with changing people's attitudes that have been Shame, filled with shame and, and, and somehow negatively coded. So the first lens that I wanna invite you to look for, because we're talking about trauma. And as you remember that in Srof's longitudinal data, and I'll remind you of Srof's book, which is that um, you have that in your reference, which is Srof is the development of the person. And this was the Minnesota 30 year follow-up of individuals who had uh, been followed from birth onward, looking at their effects of their attachment patterns. But Srof discovered, as you remember from my previous workshops, as well as your own literature, is that individuals who had disorganized attachment in childhood, number one, um, developed a high dissociative index during adulthood. And Srof then was quoted as saying, that anybody who was sexually abused during childhood, that it did not fare well in terms of mental health. And so what we find in this category of disorganized attachment is a lot of incidents of psychopathology and a lot of difficulties with regards to sexuality, as you may speak. So for the population of PTSD, you are going to get concomitant dissociation and dissociation obviously has the potential of affecting sexuality. So let's talk about that to begin with. So I know reading slides is a painful way of lecturing, so I'm not gonna do this too much. 
but there's two quotes, well, two or three quotes that I want to give you at the beginning here. So if you try not to dissociate and go away and stay with it, I'll tell the stories that go with these slides, but I won't read them to you. In this, there's a, a woman named Claudia Gold, and I gave you a reference for her at the beginning. She wrote this beautiful book called The Developmental Science of Early Childhood. And um, in this uh, book, she pulls together a lot of the work around trauma. In this case, she's talking about Bruce Perry's work uh, out of Texas. And what Bruce Perry suggested, some of you may be aware of, is that when a person becomes traumatized, there's sort of a scaffolding of what happens in the central nervous system. And that regression is actually a phenomenon that occurs in the brain, where when a person's under stress, lower parts of the brain get activated. And so she gives examples in working with children who, when they're very, very upset, seem to go back to a regressed state. And so what she does in working with the parents is she'll say, you know, if you have a, you know, a seven-year-old who's acting out and they're under a lot of stress, they may begin to act like a three or four-year-old. And so what would you do with a three or four-year-old who is crying and upset is nurture them, rock them, hold them, and soothe them. And if you do that, then the seven-year-old quickly gets back to being seven years old again. Now, I love that as a metaphor, because with trauma, what we find is that many people get stuck at T minus one. And T is the point of trauma minus one, which is somehow they stay fixated at that stage, or they regress to that stage. So it's not uncommon that when they get into the bedroom with their partner, they feel unsafe, which would be a flashback, and that their sexuality gets turned off, as you see in that brain slide, because their mind goes back to the point where it was dangerous and untrusting and unsafe to be with somebody in the nude. And so that is the really basis of dissociation where the person almost gets their mind hijacked and they go back into a flashback of mixing the past with the present. And the here and now becomes the then and there. And that's one of the dilemmas. And so the problem is that it would be revictimizing to do sex therapy with somebody who is in flashback uh, and pushing them through that could be potentially revictimizing. And so a lot of what happened in the field was pulling back from doing sexual work until you've done trauma work. The problem with that is that trauma work many times took years. So if you were in a committed relationship, your committed relationship oftentimes would not be able to stay activated because as we all know, a strong part of any committed relationship is going to be sexuality. And if you don't have sexual passion, your partner is going to feel unloved and uncared for, and therefore um, it's going to be very disturbing for the relationship. So whenever possible, I like working on the sexual relationship simultaneous to working with the trauma. Okay, so the, repeat myself a bit. This pathological dissociation can be traced to disorganized attachment. Disorganized attachment is the person who's caring for you is also dangerous. And what happens is, is that there are probably separate systems in the brain that get activated. And so what Dan Siegel always says is that what psychotherapy is about is integration. And the word integration is integration of what? One's past, present, and future, certainly. But integration of these dissociated systems of the brain and the disowned parts of self that come as a result of that. And so what happens in dissociation, as we all know, is that a child is terrified and becomes fragmented in order to survive. And in that process, they disown parts of themselves. And so the fragmentation occurs and there are parts of self that are left back uh, in time, in state-dependent memory, implicit memory, and they move on, they get chronologically older and bigger, but parts of self stay stuck in the past, waiting for that trigger. And so what triggers them 
this implicit memory gets triggered when the time comes around. And usually when you get into a committed relationship and so your partner feels safe, you also are gonna feel terrified. And so what you're trying to be able to do is have a personal narrative. Of course, one of the stuck points is that with dissociation sometimes comes amnesia or partial amnesia. And the false memory situation made this very, very confusing because you don't want to somehow encourage people who are having parts of memory come back uh, and lead them in any way because you don't want to do any harm to a person. And you know, a lot of problems came when people thought maybe this meant that I'm sexually abused because I've inhibited sexual desire. Truth be told, if you go into a gynecologist's office, about a third of women will say that they have inhibited sexual desire. The incidence is enormously high, and those statistics are fairly reliable. And as many as 60% of women in a general population will say they don't really enjoy sex with their partners. So inhibited sexual desire is in epidemic proportions, and we don't want to attribute all inhibited sexual desire to trauma. So in order to be able to avoid that, you have to allow what unfolds to unfold. And the way most of us have dealt with that is we um, get away from the, just the focus on the sexual abuse or the PTSD trauma. And we look at the wider context of the development of, that occurred with the individual that maybe contributed to the, to, to the disorganized attachment. And disorganized attachment is a very complex phenomena, and it's not just about PTSD. So the focus is on disorganized attachment rather than simply on the PTSD. Now, if the person's having full-blown flashbacks of sexual abuse, then obviously you need to do that trauma work. And in my previous webinar, um, Lori and I talked about how you do that work uh, in, in some detail. So in this workshop, I'm not going to be talking about resolution, trauma resolution therapies. I'm going to be talking about sexual therapy therapies. Okay, and one last long slide like this, and um, bear with me, please. It says, from a dissociative process perspective, thinking about the normative but separate domains of sensuality and sexuality is really important. Now, let's think about that for a minute. Sensuality is the ability for your senses to get activated, which means that when you, when you touch somebody, your body responds through touch, smell, taste, and so on. And that sexuality is the pelvic response that responds to sensuality. What happens when sensuality and sexuality become separate? Well, if you think about it, what most of our clients who have trauma tell us is that if they felt, they felt terrified. And it was very hard to go to school and learn your arithmetic tables and socialize with your friends and then come home to a home that was terrifying and overwhelming or you would be beaten or watch people fighting. And so the context of all that is that they get, children have the ability to dissociate and become virtuosos in dissociation so that they can be one person in one situation, another person in another situation. Those are survival strategies, but you survive at the cost of the development of self, meaning that your self-differentiation becomes highly impaired. And so you get older and bigger, but your sense of self doesn't get integrated. And that same thing happens with your sexuality, which is that you get so good at not feeling that you not only don't have a coherent sense of self, but it's hard to be present in your body in some ways. So for the average client that I'm seeing, they're coming in and they're saying, you know, when I just as soon not have sex and my partner really likes it, so I feel like I need to oblige them in some way. And this quote at the bottom, you know, I'd rather be knitting than having sex. And while I'm doing it with him, I'm a million miles away, but he never notices. But it's horrifying if you think about it. And I would have to say that this may be endemic, both with women and men who have disorganized attachment, because number one, they dissociate while having sex and therefore become, it becomes more obligatory 
for men, they oftentimes become impotent and end up, you know, taking Viagra. And for women, they tend to service their partner. Uh, and that then creates a much worse problem, which we call sexual aversion. And so my goal is that a person never has sex as a way, an obligatory way, because in many ways that seems to me for another form of revictimization, and I don't want to encourage that in any way. So they get too good at not feeling, and they don't know how to turn their feeling system back on. And this is not just a psychological phenomenon, but it literally is in the brain that happens automatically as a protective mechanism. And it's probably really robust if you think about it, because of all the systems in the brain that have to be incredibly large, it would be protecting oneself and feeling safe. That would be one system that we would not have survived as a species if that alarm system in the adrenals wasn't activated properly. And the other system is the attachment system. If we didn't cling to our mom when a saber-toothed tiger was chasing us, then we wouldn't have survived. So the two major systems of the brain, the safety system and the attachment systems are both involved with sexuality. And so we're doing repair of both of those systems. I hope that makes sense because it's those lenses that really govern everything that we're gonna do intervention wise in the bedroom. Now you're thinking to yourself, geez, that seems like a lot. And what I would say is that even though it's a lot, What's incredible in my experience is the robustness of mother nature wants to reproduce itself. So it is possible top-down kind of work to repair this system. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Next slide. Okay, so uh, I promise you there wouldn't be one anymore, but there is this one last one, which is, I wanna just add a punctuation. Because we've been focusing on hyposexuality but most individuals that I see have hypo and hypersexuality. And part of the reason for that is, is that the system gets activated and deactivated at the same time. And so it's possible, for example, that a person can be looking at pornography and masturbating three times a day and not be aroused by their partner at all. And that's pretty dramatic. And so, um, remembering that we're trying to facilitate the activating system and we're trying to uh, deactivate the inhibitory system. And so what happens is that when you find a partner, then the bonding system gets activated, the attachment system. And what you see with disorganized attachment is this phenomenon of repetition compulsion. And so not only do we have these sexual issues, but many times the person is prone to repeat. And what happens is, is that for some reason, they tend to move towards partners that somehow allow them to repeat what's unfinished in childhood. And you know Freud noted that uh, in the original repetition compulsion concept, but very little has been written by this, except for you know, Bessel van der Kolk, who has reactivated our interest in this uh, for the last 20 years, but very little has been written on it. Um, I like uh, the idea in marital therapy of working with the imago. And the imago work is incredibly predictive of the events that have occurred positive and negative in childhood tend to recreate themselves in your adult relationships. And the key is, is that the most uh, important aspect of trauma is that it will dictate the kind of partner you're going to choose. And so who we're aroused by and who turns us on, who turns us off, sometimes can be through danger. And so just like when self-cutting occurs, you can get high. And it seems weird that you get high from from something that hurts, we now have sadomasochistic kinds of behaviors where the person needs to hurt themselves in order to get aroused. Now, let me explain it from a different vantage point. When I was with Masters and Johnson, one of the things that we've got interested with inhibited sexual desire 
is that it's not just a low initiatory behavior, but it's low desire, meaning I don't really like sex, I don't really want it, and that I don't get fantasy, I don't get arousal. And the love map, that which turns a person on, seems to be deactivated in some way or trauma bonded, meaning that what turns them on is what got hardwired in. So I'm reminded of Dan Siegel's statement, statement that neurons that fire together, wire together. And so, you know, if you're five years old and your older brother's coming into your room and molesting you, there's a part of you that gets terrified and part of you that gets shamed. I can't tell anybody without this secret. And you can potentially be aroused and find it desirable. But the wires then get crossed and those wires that get crossed fire together, wire together. And so it's possible that later in life, you know, that will get activated. So for example, I saw a woman recently who when she was with her husband, he's a sweet, nice, wonderful partner, very safe. She finds no sexual arousal. And a guy at work who's a bastard and really mean and nasty, she has multiple orgasms with and she has this affair. And so she comes in and she says, I feel like I'm masochistic because I need this bastard in order to be able to be orgasmic. And my husband, who's a wonderful person, I have no interest in at all. And to me, that's a form of what I call a ricochet. It's, it's the trauma bond repeating itself, the connection between the past and the present. And so one of the goals of trauma-based therapy with sexuality is to break the trauma bond. And the way to remember that is that oftentimes trauma survivors have symptoms as opposed to memories. And what that means is that if a person has low sexual desire or has to pick a partner who's a bastard to get sexually aroused, that is a trauma symptom. It's also a trauma memory. And if you can bring that implicit memory into explicit memory, you can do what Adler once called spitting in the soup, which means that you can begin to drop that in some ways. So let me give you an example of that. I have a client who has what are called tricks. He is married with kids and he goes out and he has seven or eight homosexual tricks in an evening anonymously. And they're painful and empty, but very arousing. And so he's trauma bonded in some way. And so when he was doing trauma work with me, he remembered uh, in detail that his dad was sexually abusing him. And that became more apparent because his dad had started sexually abusing his son. And so then he had full-blown flashbacks of what happened when he was a kid. And as we began to work through that trauma and the horror of it, he remembered that when his dad would come into his bedroom, he would have what he called butterflies in his stomach. And the butterflies were this tickly feeling he had in his stomach that felt both safe and dangerous. And, you know, danger is illicit, you know, it makes your heart beat. And at the same time, it's terrifying. And so those wires obviously got crossed. And he said, whenever he tricked, he got those butterflies again. Now, I don't know if that's really sexuality at all, because it's sexuality probably disconnected from sensuality. And what was happening was affect dysregulation, excitement, illicitness, and it may not have any bearing at all to what we're calling sexuality. Because when sensuality and sexuality become disconnected, um, we have a different kind of phenomena. Dr. Masters and I, when we talked about this originally, we called such individuals ambisexual. And ambisexual meant that they weren't quite heterosexual, they weren't quite homosexual. They weren't quite bisexual. They didn't seem to have any uh, lens to their sexuality. It was sort of very autosexual. And so ambisexual somehow meant that they could get turned on by anything or anybody without uh, 
having a subject. And it was very masturbatory. And we saw a whole slew of individuals who were ambisexual, highly dissociated. And this phenomena, I think, is very, very frequent with people who have disorganized attachment, which is that sexuality and sensuality become disconnected in some ways. Okay, so you're probably thinking to yourself, wow, that makes a lot of sense, but what do we do about that? Because uh, it sounds pretty hardwired. And the answer is you're right. Um, but it is important to understand that because let me give you a point, which is that if somebody comes in and they're married to someone who hurts them and gets turned on by hurting them, I am not going to facilitate sex therapy because I am not going to encourage someone to be vulnerable with someone who's going to hurt them. It's just a blanket black and white rule. And so I'll do one of two things. I'll do marital therapy with them and see if I can help the person who's moving against to stop it. So for example, let's say that you have a partner who physically beats you or hurts you in some ways. I would never do sex therapy in such a case because I do not want to encourage someone to be vulnerable with somebody who's going to permanently hurt them. But I will work with that person who's a perpetrator and begin to wake up whatever it is that's getting activated, because it's probably trauma bonded in some way. Alternatively, I might refer them out because I'm not going to be part of something that I think is going to be harmful to an individual or a couple. So the bonus slide, I think you have at the end of your lecture. And as you pull it up, it just says contradictory cognitions about intimacy. And I, I, I throw this in, there's 13 pieces of it, but I want you to see how complex disorganized attachment can be. Because disorganized attachment is not only about the contradictory bonding, but it also contradiction about your belief systems. You can believe that others are dangerous, but you need them anyway. You can believe that um, others will disappoint you, but your partner will be different. You can believe that you're unable to care for others, but you do care for one person. So what's so interesting about disorganized attachment is that if you two, when one person can believe binary things at the same time. So you can believe that you're bad and know you're good. You can believe that you're disgusting and horrible and know that you're not. And you can believe that you're fat when you're really not. One of my clients in the eating disorder clinic came up to me one day and she said, in the hallway, you know, Mark, I looked at myself in the mirror and I saw myself for the first time today. And my eyes got big and I went into sort of shock and I said, hold it, just stop right where you are. I need to know what that means. And she said, well, whenever I looked in the mirror up to now, I saw myself when I was a teenager and I was overweight as a teenager. And that's what I saw when I looked in the mirror. But now when I look in the mirror, I see myself the way I am and I'm not fat at all. And I, went, I was just amazed that something in the brain could hijack the eyes so much. But the more I listened for that, the more I realized that so many of the individuals, what they were experiencing was really out of reality. It was a flashback from the past. For example, one person, when they looked at their genitals, what they saw was the, the genitals of a child, but not the gen genitals of an adult. And the feelings that they had were the feelings of being a child rather than the feelings of being an adult. So we, most people who've never had a dissociative experience have a hard time getting a frame of reference of where the brain can be so activated that you can go into an altered state. So I have a funny joke about this, which is one time I visited my family and uh, I come from a fairly dysfunctional family. And uh, when I visited them to Thanksgiving, we were all together and I lost my voice. I couldn't be myself. And as much as I tried to be able to speak, nothing came out of my mouth. And when I got back home, I started to laugh because I realized that I became like I was when I was 12 years old, 
when I was around my family. That trigger must have elicited a different state in my brain, and I became sort of stuck at T minus one. It just so happens that my father died when I was 12, and a lot of PTSD trauma occurred around that time. So I got stuck at T minus one, and it took that trigger to be able to bring it back. So I realized that this phenomenon isn't so uncommon, it's just that we don't see it. And we believe we have free will, but there are many circumstances where clearly we don't. And if you need proof of it, look at your history of relationships. And oftentimes you will get in relationships that you know are not healthy for you, but you feel kind of trauma bonded into it anyway. So these phenomena are much more common than we're willing to give credit for in certain ways. And it's that trauma bond that becomes important because what happens is you can believe two things at the same time. Now, sometimes beginning therapists will come in and they'll say, oh, you're not bad. Sex isn't bad. You're not disgusting. And the part of self that believes that they are feels misattuned and not understood and wants to run. So it's important for the therapist to recognize that most of the things you're going to say to a person in cognitive therapy, they already know, and it's not very useful. So the question is, how does one change these contradictory cognitions? Because integration is the goal of therapy. And the answer to that is gestalt work. In gestalt-based therapies, what you're doing is you're getting parts of self that have become dissociated to learn how to be able to dialogue with one another. And there are varieties of therapy that now allow us to do that. EMDR, internal family systems, affect accelerated psychotherapy, gestalt, expressive therapy, and somatic-based therapies all allow us to be able to have parts of self begin to communicate. So the revolution that's occurred in the last 30 years is integrating sex therapy with many of these sort of um, affect accelerated type psychotherapies, which are highly gestalt, and they allow us to be able to integrate uh, in a fairly rapid treatment model. What I want to emphasize is that what we're talking about is physiological as well as psychological. And what I mean by that is that there was this interesting um, article that came out in uh, Mullinger and, and Goodman's book called the Dynamics of Romantic Love, Attachment, Caregiving, and Sex. And uh, it's one of the only books on that topic. And it's in your reference section of my paper. But in this wonderful book, by an article by Tracy and others, what she did is she looked at individuals who had disorganized attachment and compared them to people who had secure attachment. And what she found was that when they were adolescents, that they had sex with the same frequency of the securely attached. But what they said was they were doing it because of peer pressure and that they did it to please the partner out of curiosity, but that they didn't feel anything in the genital region and their genitals were relatively numb. Now, I thought that was really remarkable because the data that has been now shown is that with disorganized attachment, but there's a deactivation of the pelvic system. So when their um, genitals are touched, they literally don't turn on. It feels numb. And just like their affect system is numb, their genital system is numb. And so the question is, if that part of the brain is not being activated, how do we activate the, the genital system. Now the clue is, is that something has coming in to turn it off. That's what that brain slide showed. There's an inhibitory system. So what we, we need to do is two things. One is we need to facilitate the activating system and deactivate the inhibitory system simultaneously. And that's the basis of good sex therapy. I thought there's a book by Esther Perel that came out. And I thought that was one of the most useful books in the last 10 years in this on the activating end, because what she does is she wakes people up to the joy of sex, but not in a performance oriented way, but
but more in a self-activating sort of way. Um, and, um, but she doesn't deal very well with the inhibitory side of this. And that's, we'll be hitting some of both of those today. In this slide, it just reminds you what Freud said, which I love this quote. A thing which has not been understood inevitably reappears like an unlaid ghost. It cannot rest until the mystery has been solved and the spell broken. Now, what that means to me is that many times the trauma is going to stay latent. And what happens is, is that when a person gets into about college age or somehow when they're independent of their family of origin and have enough safety and security, what happens is their pair bonding system turns on and their loneliness gets increased and they're activated to find a partner. And when that happens, the terror of what happened to them as a child is also going to get activated. And so we'll see this oftentimes begin to appear and that it unfolds oftentimes. So they may come in at the beginning of having flashbacks. And then as they get safer and safer in the therapy room, um, then the, the, it gets activated. Okay, so this is one of my clients' quote, and in it, she taught me something really important that I want to teach you. She said, as a child, I would lock myself in the bathroom and play with dolls the way I had been touched. One would be in bed and the other would fondle him or her. I couldn't understand why I did this or where it came from. I was ashamed of this awareness, but couldn't help acting it out. I thought the shame belonged inside me, that the awareness was created solely from me. So the first point of this is that once a person has been sexually abused, then their brain can't integrate it because it's overwhelming. It's an implicit memory. And the person may not even remember what happened to them, but their behavior will reenact it. And so they may have genital pelvic arousal and movement. And so they might start compulsively masturbating um, and feel shame and defective from it in certain ways and not understand where it came from. So to me, it's a re-victimization to not even remember, but somehow feel like you're bad. Then she says, during the teenage years, I turned to boys to duplicate some of those feelings, being cared for or loved. I knew I was fooling myself. I found an emptiness that I was left with. That's a really important statement. After my liaisons with boys, but it was all I had. I was desperate to feel love. My need for affection was so great, I couldn't say no. So your ability to say yes and no st stays fixated at T minus one. And so you don't feel powerful or in control and therefore you get re-victimized over and over again. And so the average person who's molested as a child might get raped six, seven times after that before they come into our office. In addition, they oftentimes now turn to pornography. So what happens is they don't know, remember what happened to them, but they'll start looking at more and more pornography, feeling saturated, needing more and more stimulation to turn themselves on. And oftentimes their pornography becomes illicit, thereby sort of punctuating this idea that they're deviant and bad, because why else would they look at deviant fantasies or arousal patterns? Now, what happens when they do that is they're hardwiring into their brain, not only deviant arousal patterns, neurons that fire together, wire together, but also the absence of sensuality. Instead of turning on by touch, they're turned on by vision. And it works because it's safe to get turned on to a, porno to a pornography on a screen because it's not a person who's going to hurt you. And so it becomes highly activating to turn to pornography, except for it gets boring and it's you're lonely and empty. So then she says, do you want to know why I had my tubes tied? And she says this to her mother, because whenever I thought of myself around a child, a mental image would appear. That image was clear and I believed it with certainty. I saw myself not being able to control the things that lived in me from you. I saw myself fondly, fondling sexually my own infant. Now, that is a flashback that is getting reactivated, but then the person worries that they're going to hurt another individual. And that's the beginning of victim becoming victimizer. And so because they have that image in their head, they think that they're a pervert and they think that they might hurt another person. 
and sometimes they end up doing. So when we started asking people these questions, what we found was that it was not uncommon for young people who had been sexually abused to touch while they were babysitting as a way of trauma bonding in some ways. And it was far more common than we had recognized. So victims oftentimes become victimizers. They victimize themselves and sometimes other people um, as a way of reenacting or trauma bonding. So in the previous workshops that I've done, what we've emphasized is in working with the associative nature of sexuality, it's important to reclaim the parts of self that were sacrificed to gain safety. Obviously, this is a psychoanalytic, psychodynamic model, and we haven't thrown the baby out with the bathwater. But in more gestalt kinds of work, when we ask them to turn to that injured part of self, they hate it. They blame it. And oftentimes that includes the body. And so they hate their body, they hate their genitals, and they have body dysmorphia. One of the things that we found in the eating disorder clinic was that almost, you know, with more than 50% frequency in our experience, bulimics who were binging and purging had been sexually abused in some ways. And so the connection between being sexually abused as a child and binging and purging needs delineation. And what happens is you have to somehow attack the body. You have to punish the body. The body's bad. And natural functions, which are an appetite, needing to love and food, need to be controlled in some way. And so at the origin of bulimia, oftentimes is the need to somehow feel in control, to punish, to hurt. And so we underestimate body dysmorphia. It is a nasty syndrome. And being able to help a person do that really requires somatic kinds of therapies. And if you think about it, you know, the, the pioneer for somatic therapy was um, Pat Ogden when she wrote this book, Trauma and the Body. And it's referenced at the beginning. And, you know, this is a relatively recent book. And the beginning of somatic-based therapies certainly came before Pat. But a lot of these were dance movement therapists who really were allowing themselves to begin to understand movement of the body. And so another component of what we're talking about here is A, the ability to move the body and feel comfortable in your own body, and the ability to feel the feelings in your body. And so there is now a new term we had a term called alexithymia, which is the inability to recognize emotions and emotional states. And now we have the term alexisomia, which is the inability to put words to sensations of the body. And so, you know, if I touch the inside of my arm here and I do it really lightly, it feels kind of tickly, it feels kind of soothing, it's really smooth and I can feel my arm, I can feel my fingers. There's a lot of sensations that I'm feeling, but if you have alexisomia, you cannot put words to your experience. And there is this huge number of people who are not in their bodies, they're outside their bodies. And so if you ask them, you know, did you notice the flowers when you came in today that are blooming and the colors, they'll look at you and they'll say, what flowers, what color? And most of us are not in our bodies because we're so overstimulated in certain ways. But add to it that you have alexithymia and alexisomia, and you are not paying attention to that. And literally, you're not in your body. You're dissociated. You're outside your body because that's the only place that would be safe. If you could be in your body, you would feel. And if you felt, you would feel terrified. And who wants to feel terrified? So there's motivated. So we call these systems protective, meaning that they once allowed you to survive, but now are creating your inability to connect and feel safe with other human beings. Because connection and safety, you must be in your body. So, you know, if you think about what I've said so far, you gotta be a sex therapist, you have to be a marital therapist, 
you have to be a trauma therapist and you have to be an eating disorder therapist. And then you have to be able to work body dysmorphia. I mean, these are a lot of skills and each of them require a certain amount of training that are associated with it. Um, and what happens if we don't assess these things and diagnose them on the front end, then the client won't get fully better and they'll, they won't be able to see it. So we have to be able to assess and diagnose these things in order to be able to do it. So we have scales that assess body dysmorphia, so on. Now to add to it, you know, we're getting a lot of addiction. So people are now addicted to marijuana, and addicted to alcohol on top of this. And so, you know, they're going to 12 step meetings and thinking that's the therapy. And it's certainly a step in the therapy to get sober. But, you know, they were using marijuana and they're using alcohol to numb themselves out because it's a protective mechanism because they don't want to feel. And so most people who treat addictions now are teaching people how to be able to deal with alexithymia and alexisomia. But if they start feeling, they're going to remember and they're going to feel, and it's not going to feel very good. So uh, part of this is we've had to learn to treat chemical dependency as well as eating disorder, as well as trauma, as well as sexuality. And at Harmony Place, that's what we do. That's the focus of our treatment. Um, and you know, a little advertisement, which is we do treat people here uh, and we do it in a 30, 60 day partial hospitalization model. We have them live in our house on campus and then we allow them to be able to come in for six hours a day of treatment. And it's incredibly robust. And you know, most of the people reach the goals that they've set. That's all the marketing I'm gonna to do today. All right, now let's turn to sexual arousal. Because in low sexual desire, remember, it's not just initiatory behavior, but it's also the genital pelvic region is not getting activated and the fantasy patterns, the love map is not being activated. So we have to pay attention to that variable also. Okay, so as I've said to you, that the, the common pattern for us is hyper and hyposexuality at the same time. And that the reason is because they're intimacy disorders. I can't get close to anyone. And so um, when I'm having sexuality, I'm not really having sensuality. So you can masturbate uh, six times a day and not enjoy being with your partner. And that's more common than not in my experience. And since I treat sex addiction, what I find is that people who have been sex addicted, once the sex addiction is in remission, they oftentimes turn to hyposexuality and they can't get turned on by their partner. So we usually have to treat hypersexuality and hyposexuality simultaneously. Um, and so what happens is that if disorganized attachment, two parts of self are getting activated, the excitatory and the inhibitory. All right, so when the template form was based on early experience of terror, and so they're getting both simultaneously. And so I had a client in my office yesterday and she said, I need your help. When I'm with my partner, in this case, it was her wife, I don't seem to be able to reach orgasm. And in order to be able to reach orgasm, I have to imagine the incest I had with my brother. And that's very yucky. It makes me feel bad about myself. Now, in the, a lot of the sex therapy literature, what they will say is, is that, hey, it doesn't hurt anybody to fantasize. And if you need to fantasize that, no problem. Just use it. You don't have to feel like it's disgusting. I reject that. I don't like it. I don't think it's right. I don't agree that anything you fantasize is okay. And I don't think that if you fantasize somebody urinating on you, there's more power to you, you're not hurting anybody. Because you're hurting yourself. And what you're recognizing is it's a form of re-victimization. And sex therapists who sort of say, you know, that's judgmental and you're applying your judgment onto others, that worries me. 
Now, this is particularly true in the gay community, because in the gay community, though, what they'd say is you straights are somehow mandating your value system on us. If we want to have sex six times in an evening and we want to be beat while we're doing it, you know, what's the problem? And the problem is that it's an intimacy disorder and the, the person is lonely even when they're with partners. And so, you know, I'm not one to make somebody into a patient and I'm only talking about the people who come to my office, but I think that to tell such a person that there's nothing wrong with that behavior, what we're always trying to do is facilitate connection and safety, connection and safety. And when you love somebody, we want you to be able to be in your body, feeling both the feelings of love and arousal. Now that gets us to the next point, which is that oftentimes the person has no frame of reference of what love is. I mean, it's like, how, if you had to describe what oranges taste like, how would you put that into words? Well, it's hard. Well, how do you tell somebody what it feels like to be in love? Well, a lot of poetry and prose has attempted to be able to do that. But my experience is, is that a large number of my clients have no frame of reference what it means to love. They stay with a partner out of habit and safety, but they do not feel the feelings of affection. Why? Duh. They have avoidant attachment. Avoidant attachment will blow out your ability to connect to other people. If you can't connect to other people, then the schema of safety, trust, power, control, and intimacy, all those schema which are hardwired into the brain are interfered with in some way. So to connect, we need to feel safe, we need to feel connected, we need to feel in control, and we need to feel somehow trust. You know, and so. Our job in sex therapy, Mission Impossible, is to create a relation that has safety, trust, power, control, and intimacy. And it can be done. And I'll give you a preview of coming events. It can be done in a brief therapy model. Having done this for many, many years now, I was originally trained in the Masters and Johnson format. And Masters and Johnson had people come in for two weeks, 14 days, and live in a hotel and spend 100% of their time together. And they worked in marital therapy on building safety and trust in the relationship and dealing with individual factors that block that. And they dealt with sexuality by doing sensually based kinds of interventions. And in that format, they had a very high success rate. And when people began treating inhibited sexual desire, they threw away that model because they thought that was only for sexual dysfunction. But truth be told, that's a highly robust model for dealing with sexual arousal and desire problems. And my experience is that the closer I stay to the original model, the higher the success rate. Many couples will come in and they say, I can't take two weeks off of work or who's gonna take care of the kids or I can't afford it. And so I'll see them once or twice a week, you know, for over a month period of time. And my experience has been the further I get away from the model, the less frequent I see them over a longer period of time, the less successful I am. So what I tend to do now is I tend to do trauma work first and do trauma resolution therapy. And then I do sex therapy in the intensive format and it's very highly effective in reaching the goals. Now I'll show you how we do that next slide. Well, one of the things that comes in is that, well, Mark, what if the person is not turned on by another person? John Money called that the love map and that it's not hardwired into the brain. Well, the answer is you have to begin to do fantasy work with them and begin to build in new fantasy patterns. Can fantasy patterns be changed? The answer is yes. Fantasy patterns can change. How do you change them? You have to feel connected and safe with a partner. And you have to pick a partner who is safe to be able to do that with. So when you pick someone who's safe and trustworthy, i.e. somebody who's securely attached. Now, if you ask me, if you have disorganized attachment, 
what is the best way to help you move towards what Mary Main called earn secure attachment? The answer is find a partner who's securely attached. That will be better than any psychotherapy. And don't push them away. Allow yourself to stay there even though it's going to be terrifying. You know, ride it and get through it to the other side. And you will find that will begin to change the terror and fear system, safety and trust in your mind. And what will happen is naturally your fantasies will begin to turn to that partner. So what we do is we facilitate arousal to a safe partner while beginning to condition out the, the deviant or somehow undesirable fantasy. And so it's a simultaneous process of knocking out the, the fantasies that are trauma bonded while building in the fantasies of someone who's desirable. You're saying, well, Mark, are you saying you do that in a two week program? Absolutely. But it doesn't finish itself in a two week program. I oftentimes like the Buddhist principle that if you want to play the violin, you don't pick up a violin and play it today, but you have to practice it for a half hour a day. And if you do that, you'll get really good at playing the violin. Well, if your brain has been trauma bonded over a long period of time, and it's been cemented through masturbation and pornography, this is not going to change itself in a short period of time, but you have to just practice the violin every day. And so we give them a, a set of patterns to be able to practice on a daily basis to change that habit. And if you can begin to fantasize someone who's safe and who loves you, and you can begin to knock out some of the, the trauma bonded fantasy. And we do that partly by what we was talking about by spitting in the soup, but also through operant and uh, conditioning kinds of techniques, which I'll refer to a bit later. And I wrote about in my paper. Now, as I've said, it is now more common than not that somebody who's been sexually abused or now we're talking about a broad range of trauma, not just sexual abuse, but oftentimes disorganized attachment is a multitude of horrific things happening to a human being, both in and out of the home. And it also includes neglect. Now with eating disorder, what you find something interesting, which is that it, you don't get trauma in the traditional sense with anorexia, but you oftentimes get enmeshment. And with enmeshment, somehow there's been interference with individuation. And so tra traumatization can begin with uh, a person who is not allowed to individuate. And that um, on the other end, there are individuals who have been hurt in some ways. So when we're talking about trauma, we, we need to define what we mean by trauma. And neglect is trauma, enmeshment is trauma, and abuse is trauma. And all three of them have very similar long-term effects. A lot of our anorexic clients will come in and they'll say, you know, I've not been locked in closets and burned out with cigarettes and therefore I don't deserve to be here. And they have to learn to understand that somebody who keeps them from individuating, who is enmeshed with them, who doesn't allow their self to develop, can be as harmful for that individual in the long run as somebody who's locked in closets and burnt with cigarettes in terms of the long-term effects. So what will happen then is too, too much inhibition. And so the person is terrified. And while they're enmeshed with their family, they're not learning how to operate in the world. And so things happen when you're five years old, seven years old, nine years old, 11 years old, 13 years old, learning takes place. But if you're traumatized, you isolate and you don't learn those things. And if you're enmeshed, you isolate and you don't learn those things. And so the common factor in both of those is the lack of individuation and what Greenspan calls structural deficits. They learn structurally to have boundaries, to show uh, uh, bonding kinds of gestures. So something like how to solicit someone, that's something really important. A phenomenon which might be called seduction. Think about it. Seduction is an important part of eroticism. Moving towards somebody who you're really turned on by, being able to flirt with someone who you really interests you, you don't know how to do those. If they are terrified, 
you're never going to be able to get into a sexual relationship, except for if you pick up the phone and call one of these dating sites at three o'clock in the morning and say, hey, do you want to come over and screw me and have anonymous sex? And so we have this huge number of people coming into my office that are somehow um, going on these websites and having anonymous sex in a very dangerous way and repeating the trauma bond. And it's very, very scary. And so they lack the solicitation courtship kinds of abilities. And instead, they're trauma bonded and they go from two in some ways. Now, if you then apply that to being married, let's say you find somebody who likes you and you have, um, let's say, anxious attachment, the other end of avoidant attachment, and you'll bond promiscuously with anybody who wants you because of anxiety. So you cling on to somebody and you have that anxious attachment kind of pattern. Then what happens is, is that oftentimes you get into the bedroom, you don't know how to touch, you don't know how to hold, you just have intercourse and you think intercourse is, is vagina, vagina, penis to penis, genital, genital. And that is not sexuality. That is something else. It's maybe fucking or copulating. But what we're talking about is they have no frame of reference of the whole body response in making love to another human being. And so when we say making love, we don't articulate what's involved in it and what you mean by it and what somebody who's had attachment problems means by it can be night and day. And so part of the therapy is understanding the structural deficit the person has and also the body may be terrified by this. I have clients who have PTSD that are in the military that I'm seeing from Afghanistan and Iraq. And the only way they can feel is by jumping out of airplanes and they all want to go back to Afghanistan and be shot at and maybe killed in battle. And it's horrifying to me that even though the experience is terrifying, it's the only way they can feel alive. And that's an ultimate trauma bond. But it's not a whole lot different than a client who's saying that in order to get aroused by my partner, I need to have them slap me or beat me or do something painful to me. Um, and where I have to imagine my perpetrator. Now, how common is that? Let me tell you something interesting. When I was with Masters and Johnson, we did a, a random sampling of the population to look at fantasy and arousal patterns because we didn't know what normal was. And what we found is that in the top five fantasies of women who were not complaining of any sexual problems in the normative population, there was a high frequency of imagining somebody uh, who was faceless, who was holding them down while they're having sex. And they use this fantasy pattern when they were with their regular partner. And among the men, it was very common that they had rape fantasies in order to get aroused with their regular partner. And therefore, it probably is endemic in our culture because we have so much violence and so much trauma in childhood that people don't know what normal is. And they think that their patterns are normal when they're not. And what is normal to me, and I use that word with quotes because it's highly judgmental, is the ability to connect to a human being that you care for. We have to have some understanding of what our goal is. And our goal is to be able to be aroused by a person who's safe and loving and feel connected to in some way. And that has to be the ultimate goal of the work itself. That may sound judgmental, and perhaps it is. Okay, now, the first thing to remember is that this is physiological as well as psychological. And, you know, the, if a man has low testosterone, it's probably going to affect their sexual desire. Although that's quite variable because you get huge differences. You have men who have testosterone of 200 all the way up to 1,200 uh, and don't seem to have a whole dramatic effect. But it's unknown. Um, but what we do know with trauma 
is that trauma is a hallmark of PTSD is changes in the cortisol system. And uh, long ago, it was published that the criteria of PTSD needs to be understood that there's a disruption of the cortisol adrenal system. And so what happens oftentimes, particularly with childhood trauma, is that when you're traumatized, the cortisol, instead of it going up as expected, goes down. And when the cortisol goes down, when you're traumatized, it means it is a di disorder of the adrenal system and it takes much longer to do trauma therapy than if the cortisol goes up. And this is some of Rachel Yehuda's work that was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Now, that's important with sexuality because guess what? People who have hyposexuality have a dysfunction in the cortisol system. And what you find is that instead of activating the cortisol system and it going up, that they, they get terrorized and their cortisol goes down. And so it becomes a hallmark of hyposexual desire that the cortisol system is in a dysfunctional state. Now, we still don't know what to do about that. You know, you can do a, a test for that and be able to diagnose it. Um, but even if you test that, um, our ability to treat it uh, is, is still very um, primitive. So uh, I'm going to put that in the I don't know realm. But we do know that um, when you feel close to another person and you feel aroused, you're supposed to feel safe. And the reason you don't is because you're getting an outpouring of, of the dysfunctional cortisol system. So you get scared when you're supposed to feel safe. And it's a cortisol problem. Next the other thing, as I've mentioned, is the body dysmorphia piece of this. This is that slide of the Barbie doll. And remembering that when you are abused as a child, it feels like you're an object, not a subject. And endemic in our culture is women who are treated like objects and act like objects because they're treated like objects. And so, so much of their sense of self is defined as you know, how large their breasts are or how small their breasts are or how sexy they are or all the body things that are with weight and so on. And so since it's endemic to be objectified, um, the idea of being an object in sex is that you kind of lay there and are done too because you feel like an object or the alternative of that is, you know, you, you know, breathe ah, 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 and exaggerate it and somehow in order to be sexy. But either of those are being an object. And the result of that is what we call performance anxiety. So performance anxiety, which is endemic and is the major cause of sexual disorders is because you feel pressure to perform for the other person or for the culture in a certain way. And so the ultimate of good sex therapy is helping people move out of performance anxiety and being with somebody and connected to them and making love with them in some ways. So how do we manifest that? Okay, the tool to do that was invented by Masters and Johnson and it's called Sensate Focus. Now, some of you have heard of that and probably know what I'm talking about. But I doubt if you know what Sensate Focus is, because having been with Masters and Johnson for many, many years on staff, what they wrote in their book did not in any way capture what I saw being done on a day-by-day -day basis. It's just not been written about or understood. Constance Avery Clark and Linda Weiner, who work with me, tried to delineate that in one of their papers, and they did a nice job. But um, most people have not quite got it yet. Sensate focus is a fascinating tool because when two people are nude in the bed together, they're excessively vulnerable. So it is exposure therapy because they're going to feel terrified and they're going to feel potentially aroused. And if they do that um, consistently, you can begin to knock out some of the terror particularly if your partner is trustworthy in some way. So it is certainly a tool for helping a person in exposure therapy. It is behavioral therapy, but it's far more. It's a catalyst. And what it does it, is it pops out whatever the blocks or the stuck points are to sensuality. 
So this person can say, when the person was close to me, I was thinking about my brother incesting me. Or when this person was close to me, all I could think about was how disgusting my body is. And when this person is close to me, I had to think of uh, nothing at all. I had to numb out. When this person was close to me, I had to feel pain in order to feel any. When this person was close to me, I felt disconnected. I felt alone. And so all the blocks to intimacy get popped out when you put them in this vulnerable situation. And when they pop out, you can diagnose it, assess it, and treat it. Because the client's never going to tell you. What it has to do is you have to have it pop out in some way. So insensate focus, here's what you say. I want you to go home tonight and I want you to take off your clothes and I want you to take off your partner's clothes. I want you to have some light in the room and I want you to touch your partner, breasts and genitals off limits. I don't want you to give them a massage. I don't want you to somehow make them feel good. I don't want you to turn them on, but I want you to touch for yourself. Now, what does that mean? When you touch for yourself, it's a sensual experience, not a sexual experience. And so, for example, if I take this rock and I have a sensual experience with this rock, what I notice is that it's sharp to my fingers, that it's, I can see the light reflecting off it in my eyes. It's purple and quite pretty. And yet the other side is sort of dark and kind of rock-like, but there's crystal in between. Now I could spend, if I was a poet, maybe 15 minutes talking about this. So I try to find a frame of reference. If a person's a golfer, I get them to talk about golf. If a person likes to go out to Yosemite, I get them to talk about Yosemite. If a person likes to walk in the woods and see the redwoods, then we go see the, the redwoods. Whatever their frame of reference of sensuality is, most people have it. And I want them to be able to experience their partner through that framework in some ways. Now, what have I done? Well, it took 25 years perhaps, but Thich Nhat Hanh would call that mindfulness. What is mindfulness? It means getting back in your body and associating sensuality with sexuality. What an ingenious modality. It does two things at the same time does exposure-based therapy, it puts sensuality back to sexuality, and it pops out all the blocks that are somehow interfering with that. And we call those now stuck points. Stuck points are what's blocking a person. So here's the way we frame this. If you have trauma in your childhood, you're entitled to not be sexual. Now think about that term word. It's a, I borrow it from Bernie Applebaum. And Bernie Applebaum said, if a person has destructive, shameful experiences associated with sensuality in childhood, or the people who love them hurt them, then they're entitled to not feel sexual. If you have a partner who hurts you, you're entitled to not feel sexual. If you have a partner who doesn't like you, you're entitled to not feel sexual. If you treat your body like an object, if you have body dysmorphia, you're entitled not to be sexual. If you're terrified, you're entitled not to be sexual. And so the key of sex therapy is giving person permission to not be sexual. Isn't that interesting? It's all paradoxical. So sensate focus catalyzes the stuck points, ingenious. So, okay, let's say we get through the first stage of sensate focus and they come in, they say, I touched my partner, it felt good. No, that's hyposomia. I, I do not alexisomia. I, feeling good. What does feeling good mean? What did it feel like when he touched your lips? What did it feel like when he put a hand in your hair? What did it feel like when she touched your face? What did it feel like when they touched your thighs? We want the person to begin to articulate the internal state that goes with the experience. And what we want to begin to do is model it and role play it in certain ways, beginning to turn the system back on. Now you're saying, well, does it work? The answer is, yeah. I mean, mother nature is pretty robust. 
and you know those sensations are there something is blocking it now that it's like asking can you teach a person who's not feeling how to feel and the answer is yeah you have to just have to find what's blocking them from feeling and then give them a vocabulary of feeling what, what with alexisomia it's the same thing you have to give them a vocabulary of what they're feeling and give them permission to be able to feel it so in sex therapy there were stages. The first stage is called permission giving. The second stage is called limited information giving. And permission giving and limited information, you can do that in the realm of sex therapy and sensate focus. Now, as you go to the next stage, what you say is, I want you to begin to touch your partner, breasts and genitals on limits. And this time, I don't want you to treat them like they're the goodies but you're treating them like they're any other part of the body. I want it to be a sensual experience, not a sexual experience. And so what we're doing is we're giving them permission to feel and to get away from performance anxiety of trying to please the partner, turn the partner on, and instead to get back in their body and having an experience of sensuality. So, you know, we're getting them into it. Now, in the meantime, we might do other mindfulness exercises um, outside the bedroom. And anything you do that increases mindfulness uh, in, in your general therapy practice, you know, walk therapy, meditation, anything that helps a person focus and focus on positive is going to be useful in some way. Those of you who meditate know that it takes time to learn to meditate. It took me about three months to condition my mind and it got distracted all the time. And I just kept bringing it back, bringing it back, bringing it back to my breathing. And as I did that, it was sort of like someone drilled top-down kind of changes in my brain. Because as I learned to meditate, it was an incredibly relaxing experience and just delightful to have some control over my mind in that way. Well, just like you can drill those holes in your brain in meditation and mindfulness, the same thing happens in the bedroom. You can begin to condition your mind to be able to focus on the experience of literally being with somebody and connected to them rather than performing or doing something to or for another person. But most people have no frame of reference for that. And so they're learning it and then practicing it. And that's why the intensive format is helpful. Meanwhile, we're working on their relationship. And so in marital therapy, we're using all of Gottman's stuff, all of Hendrix's stuff, all of the solution-focused therapy, um, and all those tools that we now have robustly as a marital therapist, and we're increasing the intimacy between the two outside the bedroom to parallel the intimacy inside the bedroom. Now, if they're fighting, if they're angry, if they're mad, if, they're, if they can't problem solve, if they can't deal with their emotions outside the bedroom, then it's not gonna work. And so you have to be a damn good marital therapist and as well as a relational and sexual therapist simultaneously. So we're dealing with sexual therapy, we're dealing with trauma therapy, and we're dealing with um, sexual therapy simultaneously, but we're doing it in a short-term format and they're doing it 24 hours a day, at least 10 hours of their waking day. So they're getting a lot of practice and whatever the stuck points are in the marriage evolve and jump out and whatever the stuck points are in the bedroom, and we're beginning to deal with them in directive therapy. That's the Masters in Johnson model. It's beginning to know what the blocks are for intimacy in and out of the bedroom and having directive interventions. So the therapist talks a lot, like I am today, and the therapist does a lot of work because it's a highly directive form of therapy. So entitlement. It's understandable that given what happened to you, what you've done to yourself as a result of what was done to you, and the destructive influences on your choice of partner and the relationship you created, that you don't feel sexual. It'd be a miracle if anyone could feel sexual under these circumstances. So you're always giving permission not to be sexual in order to be able to entitle sexuality. I want to throw a point in here that there are a lot of cultural differences that come into this. Out here in Monterey, which is pure heaven, we have people from many, many different cultures coming together. And we have Muslim influences. We have people from Arab countries. We have people from South America, 
you know, we have enormous number of, of different patterns. And so, you know, the most important thing is that you get to know something about those patterns because intimacy in Saudi Arabia is very different than intimacy in Monterey. And intimacy um, in, in South America can be really different than intimacy in Mexico. And so it's understanding the cultural influences upon that that are, are important. And it's endemic in certain cultures um, to have these distant patterns in certain ways. And so, but what's so interesting is that when you live in the American culture, there's so much emphasis put upon, you know, romantic love um, that you're kind of caught between two countries, so to speak, and your mind is too. And so beginning to bring these cultural influences is important. So you really have to listen to the client and understand more. Here we have a, a tremendous Mexican population. And uh, it's very, very important to get the frame of reference of what it might be like to be intimate in Mexico versus the United States and uh, some of the endemic levels of what happened there. Okay, now I said to you that there are structural deficits when you don't learn at age four or five or six. And, you know, for example, if you don't learn to masturbate, masturbation is something that you give people permission to be able to do. In American culture, 85% of women are masturbating now and 98% of men. And so you learn a lot about your body and your brain gets activated and there's a lot of structural things that occur. But if someone touches your clitoris and you feel numb, you're not gonna masturbate. And so it's not uncommon for me to have a client who's never masturbated before. And therefore, it may be that you wanna to begin to work with them in masturbatory behavior before you have a partner, because you know then all you have to do is help them deal with their body and with themselves. If you hate the body and you hate yourself, then masturbation might be the place to begin to work first. And there's a lot of sex therapies that be able to do that. Because then you can begin to feel the body tension, you can begin to move your pelvis. But you know, the interesting thing is that so many of the clients I see have no frame of reference of what play is. Think about it. Play is goalless activity that you do just for the fun of it. Now, if you never got a chance to play as a child, do you know how to play as an adult? Your idea is I go to work, I come home, I go to work and I come home. I don't play, I don't know how to play. Or creativity. Your mind plays in creativity and you have fun just allowing your mind to play. But if you've never played in creativity and you never played in reality, then how could sex be a form of play? Goalless, wonderful, non-performance activity. So you have to teach people how to play. Now, is it hard to teach people how to play? No, it's basically behavior therapy and beginning to give them specific assignments in and out of the bedroom and teach them how to laugh and be able to move their body. Now, what's the most wonderful activity for that? Dance. Dance is so great. You know, if you can just let yourself go and just dance however you dance and listen to music, well, that's a great form of therapy. So dance movement therapy um, is really wonderful because if you can dance and let yourself go, particularly in front of other people, that teaches you how to be able to let go in certain ways and play as a form of letting go. So you see all the structural things we're adding to this. And now we're not just about trauma patients, but non-trauma patients oftentimes have great difficulty with all of these things. And so we're applying standard sex therapy techniques to the trauma patient. Okay, now I wanna remind you then that we're now moving into normative because 63% of women in the general population report arousal and orgasm problems, even though they're happily married. And 85% of them reported they were satisfied with their sexual relationship. Now, what the hell? Think about that for a minute. They don't feel much, but they're happily married. And that they're satisfied, even though they don't feel much. Why would that be? These data are reliable. They're repeatable, and they're the best I can come up with in the contemporary times. So let's say you believe what's on here, because I do. Then it means in some ways what 
the people will report is that um, my partner and I really love each other. And, um, but sex is sort of boring. And it's not that interesting. And I don't get that turned on. And I don't need much more than what I have. Well, is that much different really than marital relationships outside the bedroom? If you think about it, if you've been married with somebody for an extended period of time, it can get boring. If you don't do something to create stimulation. And so in good marital therapy, what you're doing is reactivating the dating stages and reactivating you, every day you give a gift to your relationship. You do something to put some something in. The more you put in, the more you get out. And so did you call your partner? Did you write them a little memo? Did you write a note under their pillow? Did you tell them you love them? Did you do things to, as an act of kindness? Um, are you able to um, be able to um, hold them? You know, during these periods of time of, of um, this virus, do you know how to nurture? I have to teach most men what nurturing is and teach them how to nurture their partner. And they're capable of it, but they've never been given permission or taught that they need to do it. Nurturing is an important part of a relationship. And so I'm working with people and teaching them how to be able to fine tune, to tune up their relationship. And a boring relationship makes boring sex. And you may be content with it, but why be content with it? Why not? put time and energy into creating passion. And so my theory is that what's missing in the American culture is passion. We have passion for our work occasionally, but passion is missing across the board. And passion doesn't exist, passion is created. During this time of this virus, I'm spending more time alone and I'm reading D.H. Lawrence and I'm working out my garden and doing fun things I haven't done for a long period of time. And I'm writing poetry. And I just wrote a new paper yesterday. And I, I don't do it out of performance. I don't do it in order to you know, impress somebody. I do it because I like what's in me to come out of me. And all that is tremendous joy. And creativity is my greatest joy. And so since that is something that creates passion for me. My goal is to create passion in human beings, whether in marriage, whether by themselves, or whether in sexuality. Passion is something that is created, takes time, takes attention, takes motivation. And my job as a therapist is to catalyze that natural process. And the result of that is joy. When I was in school, my teacher said to me, if you want to increase happiness, if you want to decrease depression in the population, the key to that is to increase people's competencies. The more they're good at, the more they know, the less depressed they're going to be. And I never forgot that because now at a time of this COVID, what I'm trying to do is learn new competencies. The, the web is such a beautiful opportunity to teach yourself new things. And to get apathetic about teaching yourself new things, it takes effort, it takes energy, um, is the crime. So I want to be able to catalyze. Now, you, if you feel the passion in my voice, the enthusiasm, that's what it takes to be a good sex therapist. When I work with Dr. Masters, he could say to someone, I want you to go home and I want you to touch your partner's breasts. And I want you to notice the increase in size by 20%. And I want you to notice that they turn bright red, the mottling effect. And I want you to notice, and you know, when you finish, when you finish listening to him talk about the sensuality of a woman's breasts, it was sort of like, oh my God, I better go home right now and touch somebody's breasts. You know, it's sort of like it was almost hypnotic. And it brought such a wow, I, I've never seen it that way. It's the same kind of thing. You know, you can walk through a redwood forest and say, you know, I haven't got to where my destination is. You can drive across the Grand Canyon and not and be in a hurry to get to California. Or you can have an orgasmic experience 
at the incredible beauty of the nature around you. And so much of what we're doing is teaching people how to do that. You know, taste the wine and you know, you notice that you have so much more potential. The blind person, you know, their ability to experience sensuality has increased. There's an infinite capacity to experience sensuality. And we're using probably only 20% of it. And therefore we're not getting much joy out of it. And so the idea of what we're doing here is using my relationship with the patient, my own passion as a human being to catalyze that experience for the person and awake the sleepy parts of themselves. And the result of that is they see that what was stolen from them by the childhood that they had experienced is grossly unfair and they are angry about it and they want to reclaim that which is stolen from them. And if I can create that, I am going to be a success. I want them to not ever be satisfied with less. I want them to get 100 cents to the dollar and not be satisfied with 33 cents. Now, there is some technique to this. You know, if they're having flashbacks and you're doing what I'm talking about, it can be revictimizing. And so I'm very careful about that. And if a person comes in and they say, hey, I did Sense8 Focus 1, and I started having flashbacks of my brother sexually abusing me or my dad beating me, I am going to stop immediately. And I am going to take them back, and I am going to be working on trauma therapy and do trauma therapy before I do sex therapy. And that's a ground rule. But trauma therapy can take years. And so I, the, oftentimes the relationship can't wait for that. So I want to be able to work on that flashback. And so, for example, if the person says, I have to have the fantasy of my brother sexually abusing me in order to get turned on with my partner, I stop and I will begin to do trauma work on the flashbacks and do enough trauma work to be able to neutralize the flashbacks, teaching them how to do grounding and containment and how to be able to ground and contain themselves and to be able to move back from the flashback to being in the here and now. So then and there, here and now. And you know the tool to be able to do that is um, work where they can allow the parts of self to share what is an implicit memory and make it explicit. So when implicit memory becomes explicit, you can talk about it and neutralize the shame. Now, the secret of good trauma therapy, in my opinion, is not the re-experiencing part, but instead the cognitive restructuring that occurs in the re-experiencing. And so the goal of good trauma therapy is when you activate trauma memory to begin to look at the shame that is embedded in it and the self-hatred that gets hardwired in and to begin in that strong state state dependent memory to say back then you felt but can you tell that child what they need to hear now and tell her that she wasn't bad that what was done to her was bad that he is not bad that what he did to himself as a result of what was done to him was not bad and so shame work uh, and neutralizing the stigma that's associated with the early trauma is the key and the reason why it works is the person is a strong affective state. So EMDR, IFS, all those tools are, are accelerated techniques to neutralize the trauma memory and the flashbacks that then allow you to go back to the marital and sexual therapy. So I tend to do them simultaneously. Now, something simple like handwriting. What is handwriting? Handwriting means that what you do is when your partner's touching you, you put your hand on top of theirs. And the theory is you can't tickle yourself. So if the partner touches you and you feel ticklish, if you put your hand on top of theirs, it'll neutralize the tickly sensations. And so what we tend to do is in trauma work with sense focus, we have the person just ride their other partner's hand and sometimes put their hand through and show, I like this, not like that. Why? because what neutralizes anxiety is feeling in control. And when someone's touching you, it's too vulnerable. 
but when you put your hand on top of somebody, you feel like you're in control. And that's key. Now, that's a simple intervention, but if you know about it, it changes everything. Because for some people, they move from inhibited sexual arousal to what we call sexual aversion. Sexual aversion is where you're phobic of touch. I have people who, when their partner they love touches them, they throw up because they're so phobic. And the reason why they're phobic is because they force themselves to be sexual with their partners, to please the partners. So what happened is, I have a client now who says that I was sexually abused as a child, and then I went, had sex with a thousand people during my adolescence. And now I'm in a committed relationship, but I can't tell my partner that I had sex with a thousand people. And I feel disgusting because I did that. And during those years, I had sexuality without sensuality. But now when I'm with my partner, I want to be able to feel and I don't know how. That is a common problem. And what occurs with that is not only a lack of arousal, but a phobic element. It's quite dramatic if someone throws up when they're with their partner. Now, guess what? Sexual aversion is probably one of the easiest problems to treat in the realm. It has the highest success rate at our work at Masters and Johnson because phobias are highly treatable. We all know from behavior therapy that phobias have a very high success rate using exposure-based therapy. And so we simply go back to the model of systematic desensitization where a person's in control. So if a person has sexual aversion, what we say is to the partner, he or she is in control at all times. They're the boss. They say start, they say stop, and whatever they say goes. Okay, so they start by saying stop. Then what we do is we encourage the person to go one step beyond their comfort level. That's systematic desensitization. And then the second step beyond their comfort level. But they're in 100% in control of how and how much. They're in control. Do you see how powerful that is? It's a way of, in the past, things were out of control. In the present, things are in control. In the past, someone was doing to you. In the present, you're doing for yourself. And so you can begin to structurally change the brain reaction to what is happening. The other thing that happens is the ego state intrusion. With ego state intrusion, parts of self jump in. So if they're highly dissociative, an angry part will jump in. If they're highly dissociative, a numbing part will step in. If they're highly dissociative, a child part will step in. And when that happens, you have to stop what you're doing and have the client begin to talk back to those ego states and have neurons that fire together, wire together, have integration. And so you want these parts that are stuck in the past to be able to have communication with the person in the present. And facilitating internal communication is, can be part of the sex therapy. And so we'll do that with the partner in the room. I do ego state work with the partner witnessing it being done. So I might work with her about flashbacks and ego state intrusions with the partner in the room. Then I may work with a partner because uh, oftentimes you pick partners who have similar issues and we go back and forth between doing trauma work with the partner in the room as part of the sex therapy and marital therapy. Okay, so now that you're doing the sex therapy, at the same time, you're also working on the relationship. And if you don't have any frame of reference of love, the way you were loved as a child is probably the blueprint of how you're loved as an adult. And you may not know what love is. You may not know what closeness is. You may not know what connection is. You may not know what intimacy is. And so I want to begin to teach the person what intimacy is, the same way I'm teaching them what sex is. And so I'm doing a lot of work on the relationship while we're working on sexuality, as I previously mentioned. So if you have anxious attachment, oftentimes what happens is the person is like a half of a person clinging on to another person. And therefore, they're going to get terrified because when they get that close, they lose themselves. And so anxious attachment oftentimes brings up fears of, of enmeshment. Whereas avoidant attachment um, brings up, if you get too close, 
fears of closeness. And so I'm constantly with the disorganized attachment client, which is the almost 95% of the clients I see, they have both anxious attachment and avoidant attachment. So then they get lonely, they cling and scare themselves half to death and get into really destructive relationships with anybody who wants them in trauma bonded ways. And then they go back to restricting again uh, and don't need anybody. And then they go back to clinging again. And it's, it's very similar to what you see with, with eating disorder. With eating disorder, you binge, and then you restrict. You binge and then you restrict. And with sex, it's the same thing. So I found that treating eating disorders is, you know, very, very similar to treating sexual and, and intimacy disorders. They're, they're the same kind of pattern. Over control, out of control. And uh, anxious attachment, avoidant attachment. And so I do a lot of work in teaching people about attachment, teaching them about what happened to them as a child, knowing what disorganized attachment is and take from implicit memory, explicit memory. And so when somebody abandons them or hurts them, they tend to recreate that abandonment over and over and over again. So most of my clients have been injured severely by you know, 10 or more times. And they have a pattern of, of finding relationships where people will hurt them. So we have a little joke about this. If you won't leave me, I'll find someone who will. And so when they find somebody who's securely attached, they are bored to death. When they find somebody who hurts them, they're all excited and they are trauma bonded. So bringing this implicit pattern into consciousness is important. So now listen to what I've just said. It probably is a little overwhelming to you, but I said, you've got to do marital therapy. You've got to do sexual therapy. You've got to do trauma therapy. And you have to work on changing attachment patterns. And changing attachment patterns is a necessary step in treatment. And you have to move to what's called earn secure attachment. You have to have an I before you can have a we. And so I want to say something about that to end with a little bit. There's a book called In Search of the Real Self. And in this, um, Masterson writes about the real self. And Masterson is one of my big heroes. If you haven't read his stuff, it's just really juicy. He and Kohut um, are it's required reading for everybody, and Winnicott too, and ego psychologist. And real self is being able to experience emotions, to have self-activation, to be able to go out and activate in the world, to have feelings, to have creativity, to have intimacy. But really what secure attachment is, is having your own mind, that you know what's in your mind and you can listen to what's going on in your mind. It's the mind of self, in the mind of others. Now, those sounds like esoteric terms, but bear with me just for a minute. The mind of self, to know what you're thinking and feeling, both physically and emotionally. The mind of others. If you think that all people think you're disgusting and hate you, you're not going to be able to find a healthy relationship. So you have to have boundaries to know you can feel this way, but it's not true. You can think this way, but it's not true. So you're constantly looking at the cognitions of avoidant and anxious attachment and understanding that that's about what was done to you and to begin to normalize those and know the mind of self and mind of others. And so, so much of my work nowadays, you know, if you think all the stuff I've talked about is hard, the hardest stuff is moving people towards earned secure attachment, mind of self and mind of others. And the work in that is called metacognition. If you look up metacognitional therapies, uh, Bateman, uh, Fonagy, people like that, um, Dan Brown, these metacognitive therapies are juicy and delicious because they're highly oriented to teaching your, your clients mind of self and mind of others. A lot of it's basic cognitive therapy and cognitive restructuring but it's not easy because these are trauma affect bonded. And so cognitive therapies don't work. So Jeffrey Young has something called schema therapy. And in schema therapy, what he says is, what I learned from Beck in cognitive therapy does not work with trauma survivors. And all my clients are trauma survivors. And so I have to do schema therapy, not cognitive therapy. And schema therapy is cognitive affective work. 
you have to activate the affective pattern of what happened to them as a child and then challenge it through the adult's mind. And so the therapy I use most often is internal family systems because in internal family systems, you're building up the self of the individual and having the self do therapy with these disowned parts. And we're cataloging that process. So what did that child need to hear back then? You're not disgusting. You're not bad. Can you connect with that child in there, bond with her as if she was your own brother or sister? And could you tell that person what they needed to hear back then? Can you take those feelings and hold that individual and help them feel safe? And so what we're doing is called intrapsychic therapy. We're having self do therapy with parts that are injured and healing them in some way. So that's the key. And, and you know, that's taken 40 years for me to learn. John Money was my teacher. One day I was walking down the aisle with him and he said something to me at nine o'clock at night. He said, you know, Mark, he said, what I just told you in 30 seconds, it took me 30 years to figure out. And I just told that to you in 30 seconds. And I said, you know, that's the definition of a teacher. And I never forgot that. And so my idea is, it took me 40 years to learn that the key to working with trauma is moving people towards insecure attachment. And um, I really strongly recommend that you learn how to be able to do that because that is the key to all the things that I've been talking about. And of all the books that teach you how to do that, Dan Brown's book, uh, which I've referenced for you, um, is probably the juiciest with that. And the, the best person I know who teaches this is Janina Fisher. Janina Fisher is awesome because she has been trained in both somatic-based therapies um, and in attachment-based therapies. She was trained by Bessel and the best. And um, if you haven't had training with Janina Fisher, uh, it's priceless. All right, I wanna thank you all. I'm ready to take some questions if you have any. Um, their partners may not be skilled or knowledgeable about the body or religious stuff. Right. Um, so that's why I like doing couples therapy, is that as much as possible, when I'm seeing an individual, I'll bring the partner in the room right from the very beginning. And I like involving the partner because I want the partner to know that it's not about them. It's about what happened to this individual as a child. And that the feelings that they have and they're taking personally are really not about them at all. if I can go back up. All right, so it says that, um, thank you for the workshop, that's really sweet, thank you. Um, complete your online webinar evaluation, please. And... Um, right, there's one here, it says, I work with men on parole who've been molested, who molested small children. I have one client who willingly admits that he's attracted to young girls up to the age of 12. How do you change deviant behaviors when there is no partner? Yeah, the first question is, can you? And the answer is yes. That um, It finally took 30 years for people to realize that pedophilia, the most correlational factor is sexual abuse as a child. And so oftentimes it is a form of trauma bonding. And so what one has to do is knock out the deviant arousal and build in non-deviant arousal and build in empathy for victims. And so the really good programs that exist are quite good at changing people arousal patterns. And there are a variety of arousal reconditioning techniques. The one that I use most frequently is called fantasy satiation. And fantasy satiation was invented by Gene Abel long, long ago. And what you do is you have the person do boredom tapes every morning at 7 a.m. and dictate their deviant arousal patterns. So imagine just for a minute, if you, if you took a fantasy that's most arousing to you in masturbation and you dictate it into a tape machine for 20 minutes every morning at seven o'clock and then you had me come listen to it, how long do you think that fantasy would be arousing? It would, every, time you, every time you'd have that fantasy, you think of me listening to your fantasy patterns and it would quickly satiate out. So you can begin to satiate out deviant arousal patterns of facilitating. The trick of that is you can't fantasize something until you feel safe. 
until you resolve the trauma. So the first step is doing the trauma work. Second step is allowing intimacy and safety. How do you do that in a prison? You can't. And the reason is because prisons aren't safe. And I used to run a prison program and I had my own unit and, and all the people in the unit were, um, I created a therapeutic community, which was safe. And that I did amazing work, but very, very few states will allow you to have that. And that's the only way I know that to do that work. Mark, let me get, I'm gonna ask you these questions so you can just take them. Oh, yeah. Are you familiar Excellent. with how, are you familiar with how EMDR has had an effect with sexual difficulties? Well, I do EMDR every day and um, the, it's really good because it pops up. But I tend to use many techniques. I don't think EMDR by itself is, if you've been trained in EMDR and that's the only way you do trauma work, um, it's good, but not sufficient. I like having multiple techniques because I get to very different material when I do internal family systems therapy and ego state therapy than I do with EMDR and both are incredibly useful. So they're great tools. But then being trained in EMDR, you know, I was trained in EMDR by the original people who did the work 30 years ago, 20 years ago, um, by the best. And I did it that way for many years. And two years ago, I got retrained and went, went to a second week of training with the contemporary EMDR training. And oh my God, it was, it was really incredible. I learned so much more. And the new work that's being done with EMDR integrates everything that we, I've been talking about today. So EMDR is, is not, a, you know, it's very complex actually, uh, and you're doing it right. And if you've been well-trained in it, which is that week-long training, first, second, and third, if you get all three of those, uh, you can do amazing work. Mark, another question. Can you please give another example of how to break the trauma bond? I have a hard time understanding the example provided in the presentation. Right. So a trauma bond is where the past is the present. And so what happened in the present is that your past is activated. And so what happens is the repetition compulsion where you keep, um, you know, like Groundhog Day, you keep repeating so the person you know sits next to you on the plane and says, I just married my third alcoholic husband. My father was alcoholic. Why the hell do I keep doing this? Or a person who is physically abused in a marriage divorces and finds himself getting into a safe relationship and then within a year being physically abusive. How do you keep recreating these things? That's the trauma bond. And it's always about trauma. And it means implicit memory is being activated and being played out. So if you take Joanna Fisher's idea that symptoms are always trauma memories, then the reenactment is a trauma memory being enacted. It's implicit memory. The way to do that is you bring implicit memory into explicit memory. So let's say a client comes into my office and they say, uh, what's your problem? And I say, well, um, my problem is that I, um, like hurting people. Well, that's where I'm gonna start my therapy. Let's say they say, I like to cut on my body. I, that's where I start my therapy. I activate trauma memory by activating the self-cutting. And I revivify that experience in the, my office of what it felt like to cut on the body. And then I scan back in time to what in the past might've allowed them to enjoy cutting on the body. And the person, then because they're highly dissociative, is able to link the past with the present. And implicit memory becomes explicit, and I can begin to spit in the soup, making cutting on the body undesirable. And understanding, I don't want to hurt myself anymore. I don't need to hurt myself. It doesn't happen overnight, but slowly as the person feels compassion for self, then they'll begin to feel compassion for self and others, and they'll stop hurting themselves and stop hurting others. And that's what trauma therapy is. But it's always about trauma memory. Beautiful, Mark. And next question. Can you comment on BDSM power sharing where the trust and safety is explored both physically and psychologically? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think um, that you could interpret what I've said so far that I'm judgmental against that, but I'm not. I do think that if two people are consensual 
that they can experiment and explore all kinds of things. And so, you know, sex can become boring. And so, you, you know, adding a little salt and pepper is really good. It's when it becomes required that it bothers me. If, you're at, if you add a little salt and pepper to what you're doing, that's really delicious. But if you're doing it and it's necessary, so let's say you have to, let's take a fetish. Let's say a person has to be dressed up in women's clothes in order to make love with their wife. Well, it's like they're making love to the clothes and not to the wife. And they're using, they have avoidant attachment and they're using the clothes to distance themselves. Well, that is not good. So I want to treat the avoidant attachment and therefore the, I'd want to treat the paraphilia. But if you're making love to your partner and dressing up in, in certain clothes enhances the experience with your partner, it makes it more intimate, I'm all for it. So anything that increases intimacy between people, I'm in favor of. Anything that fosters distance between people and avoidant attachment, I'm not. So it's not what turns you on, it's how you use what turns you on that's really critical. Next question, I have a client that says she's stuck in other areas of her life like work and future success. She has a history of childhood sexual abuse. Would it be re-traumatizing or helpful to focus on sexuality? She also has trouble with intimacy in her relationships. Yeah, of course, that's the kind of person I'm talking about today. They're, they're perfect for what we're talking about. Next question, what is the best approach for helping women who always feel pain during sexual intercourse despite no physiological known reasons? Good question. That's called dyspareunia. And dyspareunia has many etiologies. And so nowadays, um, we have some advanced techniques of dealing with dyspareunia. And some of them include intrusive measures. So um, we have like there's such things like vulvodynia and so on that are pain in the pelvis or you have vaginismus which is pain in the outside of the vagina and then there's psychosomatic pain uh, and there's a large amount of that also and so we have photoplethysmographs that we can put a heat uh, strain gauge into the vagina and we can pick up what's going on and sometimes they're undiagnosed dermatological and pelvic reasons for this. And what's really important is doing a proper differential diagnosis because a lot of those now are diagnosable and eminently treatable. And people specialize in that and they're really good at it. On the other hand, there's a high amount of psychosomatic disorder, meaning that psychologically you can create pain when it's not there and that's called dyspareunia. And what one needs to do is a variety of uh, exercises. And so usually I use graduated dilators in masturbation and begin to, you know, the, what happens is the person is bearing down. And so there's a clonic contraction of the musculature. And what's happening is they're getting pain. And so it's like a spasm that they're creating. And if you ever have a spasm, it's incredibly painful. So what happens is you can break that spasm by using graduated dilators, but you can't just use it with a gynecologist you have to also use sex therapy with the dilators. And it, it's again, very highly effective. And at Masters and Johnson, dyspareunia had a very high success rate when it was psychosomatic. If, if it was because of, of pelvic issues, uh, it, it, you know, dermatological, it becomes much more uh, confusing to, to both assess it and treat it. Mark, we've got a few more here. Really great questions. I've worked with clients who have childhood sexual trauma that do not want to share with their partner. They have had this history. How have you seen this affect outcomes and how have you navigated this issue? Yeah, I'm not a big fan of sharing everything. Um, some therapists, you know, want you to tell, you know, all the details of your previous sex life and want you to, you know, honesty is the best policy. And I think addiction therapists are big on that where, you know, that you have to open the channel, come clean and tell everything. I'm not a favor of that. I, I think that secrets are okay in relationship. And I think that one has to decide why you're keeping the secret. And the therapist has to be very careful because sometimes telling a secret can injure the relationship permanently. So what's important to me is that you deal with the shame. 
And if you can neutralize the shame, which is oftentimes the person judging themselves. And so if I can say, it's understandable what happened to you and what you did to yourself as a result of what happened to you, and to know that it's not going to ever happen again, and forgive yourself, then that's important. But if you're looking for to kind of tell everybody and look for forgiveness from others, that's pretty dangerous. So it's not that I'm in favor of keeping secrets, but I'm also not in favor of telling everything. So there has to, the key is each individual is different and you have to assess the individual and the relationship and what it can tolerate. Mark, do you have any recommendations for working with teens who are not currently sexually active in order to help them process as much as possible so that they can move forward to having healthy sexual experiences when they feel ready to do so? Yeah, of course. When I was teaching at the university, I, I taught a course called Love Education. And uh, my first semester, 700 students signed up. And I was sort of overwhelmed. Um, and it became one of the most popular courses in the school, as you can guess. And what I did was I called it preparation for a relationship, what you need to know before you get into a relationship. And eventually a couple of books were written on that and they became incredibly uh, well used. And so at the university level, I like teaching love education and teach people what they don't know. The trouble is it's highly triggering. In this day and age, I don't know if I would have go near it because you know, you'll get sued or you'll get blamed or you'll get uh, horrible things will happen to you. So um, in this day and age, it's very, very hard to talk about any of these topics I'm talking about without finding people being rageful at you. And I've had my share of that. So uh, I, 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 you know, I, I tend to be very shy about these kind of things because it's, it, the personal has become political. And if you state something like what I've talked about today, um, you can be attacked viciously. So it's important to remember that this is a clinician's experience and I'm pretty old. One more question. How do you help an avoidant with sexual and other trauma who's married to someone who has avoidant attachment and is not aware nor doing any work to understand that and neither can talk about it effectively? Right. Add to it, they won't read a book. <laughs> it's called Mission Impossible. Um, I suppose you could find a, a webinar like this and have them listen to it. Um, there is a book that I highly recommend, um, which is called Receiving Love by the Hendrixes, Harville and Helen Hunt. And I, I, I have a hundred of them here and I kind of give them out to anybody who walks in the door. And I love that book. And it, it, it does exactly what you're talking about called Receiving Love. But a lot of people don't read books anymore. So I've got the uh, CD version of it, but then they don't have CD players anymore. So what are you gonna do? Okay, <laughs> hang in there, Mark. I believe sexual trauma can be caused by watching sexually deviant graphic behavior, violent torture, abusive porn, which is now mainstream porn. And there are people who have never been sexually abused themselves, but particular content is traumatic and can minimize, or excuse me, can mimic abuse. Children forced to, or who stumble upon graphic images end up with trauma that needs dealt with in a similar way. Many want to act it out like those who have been molested. Absolutely. I think in one of my previous webinars, I, I talked about sexual compulsion. And what I said in that webinar was that pornography uh, is starting a whole new set of problems. I'm seeing an epidemic of young people coming in who cannot be aroused sexually by their partners. And they cannot be aroused sexually by touch. And they started masturbating at age 10, 11, 12 to pornography. And they did it you know, daily five or six times, they, they needed more and more because of tolerance uh, developing. And they've trauma bonded their mind. And I would call that normative in this day and age. So we have a whole new set of problems created by this pornography. And um, I treat it, and I treat it a lot like what I'm talking about today, which is they 
are not, they, I basically make them abstinent for pornography and have their partners monitor the computers and begin to teach them sensate focus and enhance their relationships because they develop avoidant attachment uh, and they're unable, their whole system of the brain that's aroused by touch is basically undifferentiated. And so I use sensate focus as a tool and I've been highly successful, but it is one nasty problem. Wow, Mark says here, how do you get males who've been sexually abused to address their abuse? In my experience, there's so much shame that the mere mention of the abuse causes a shutdown even after safety has been established. Hmm. Boy, these questions are uh, legendary. <laughs> uh, you know, want to know the truth? I'm going to tell you the truth because there's a lot of pat answers to that. The truth is they have to find a safe partner who can invite them gradually to face their shame. And when somebody loves you, miracles can happen. But um, outside of that, I, I have not had a lot of, oftentimes they'll get a symptom, they'll come in because they're depressed or obsessive compulsive. And so that symptom will drive them into the therapist's office. But other than that, um, oftentimes they, you know, we're getting a high suicide rate, uh, probably related to that. So it's a nasty problem too. And But if you find somebody to love you, it seeds the development of the real self. Mark, two more great questions. One is, can you discuss freezing? Discuss what? Freezing. Freezing. Yeah, I can. Yeah, it, thank you, because it. I didn't talk about that. And... Um, it's really important that I left that out and didn't mention it, which is that, as you state, the natural response to terror is to freeze. And so what happens at T minus one is that that whole system of the brain gets activated and uh, the freeze goes into motion and the person becomes stuck there and they're numb. And so that freeze response gets activated when they're making love. And so they become numb and become frozen. Also, their ability to say no is permanently injured. So I say that the ability to say no is stuck at T minus one. So let's, I had a client yesterday who was uh, drunk and another man uh, started having sex with him and he froze and the man had sex with him. And now he, uh, tried to commit suicide and was unable to talk about the event because he felt so much shame around it. And I helped him in one session begin to understand that freeze response and understand that his capacity to say no was absolutely taken away when he was sexually abused as a boy and he was basically in flashback. And as he began to understand that and reown that boy, uh, he could forgive himself because in his mind all that homophobia got activated and he's not um, bisexual but he it was really more like a rape and uh, the other guy is bragging about it and the guy doesn't even know that he raped him because he thinks he seduced him into you know helping him discover his bisexuality so he's telling everybody so it's making insult and injury for the person so you can just see how uh, difficult that becomes add to it that he probably was sexually aroused. And so because he was sexually aroused, he thinks he wanted it. But just because you respond physically doesn't mean you want it. The body responds sometimes in a natural sort of way. And you can be raped and get aroused, as we all know. So it's beginning to educate the person on some of these factors. Thank you for Mark, bringing that question up. Last question. I work with sex offenders in the Department of Corrections. A lot of these clients have a history of trauma, childhood sexual abuse, and other abuse issues. We cannot do trauma work Trauma work in the Department of Corrections. CBT and motivational therapies are what we use. You state these are not the best for these clients. What are therapies you would recommend for them when they return to the community? I know you mentioned schema therapies, metacognition, et cetera. Are there any you would recommend specifically for this type of client when they're able to seek these treatments on their own or through parole? Yeah. Well, as I said, I, in one of my 
previous incarnations, I ran a, a sex offender program for a prison in the state of Missouri. And my job was to set up the program, establish the milieu, and then uh, supervise it. So yeah, I know a lot about that. And what we did is we looked at lots of different states and what they were doing, and then did, we built upon that. So there are you know, programs probably in every state now, uh, which are highly successful, but they have multiple components. And you know the sexual piece of it is sort of the last. The, the bottom line, if I can answer your question in one sentence, it's empathy. The ability to feel one's own pain and to feel the pain of others. But prison is not the place to do it because if you feel empathy in prison, you will be re-victimized. And so what I did is I took people in their last year of their sentence and put them in a therapeutic community for the last year of their sentence. And if they participated 100%, they could stay in the program. If they didn't, they would get put back in the main cell. So I was trying to rehabilitate them and the last year is the best time to rehabilitate them. When it's obliged that they have treatment by the state, it becomes hard to do that because you can't become empathetic and vulnerable in a situation when you're gonna get the shit beat out of you. So it's a really difficult kind of thing. And if what you're gonna say isn't uh, treated with confidentiality, but is gonna be used to shame you, it's gonna make you worse. Prisons are make people worse, they don't make them better. We all know that. Mark, one final question. What is your success with treating a fetish? i.e. letting the fetish go? It depends on the person. You know, if, if they're highly motivated, it can be great. And if they have a loving partner, it can be great. Um, it's like eating disorder. Most of the patients who come in with an eating disorder are as motivated to keep it as they are to give it up. And so what you have to do is be able to motivate the part of them that wants to give it up and help the part that keeps it understand that they're using the behavior as a form of avoidant attachment. And so if they begin to have that education and understanding, you can get the part that wants to hold on to it to eventually feel safe. All these behaviors are a way of feeling safe with avoidant attachment, but ultimately they increase your loneliness, they don't decrease it. So what one of my clients said, listen to what this therapist is telling you. When I first went in there, I thought he was full of shit, but I started doing what he said and my life is a hundred times better. Intimacy is the answer. Letting someone love you and being loved by another human being is a thousand times better than any fetish or paraphilia. Great. Thank you all for coming. It was nice to have you. And I hope you'll stay in touch. Thank you all. Bye-bye.